over the next 30 days as we enter into this new series, Reaching Your Potential, that you will reclaim the dreams that God once put in your heart if you have stopped pursuing those dreams. Remember when you were a little kid and you dreamed about, you know, being an astronaut or an Olympic athlete or a princess, ladies, right? Uh, Verify that these days. Uh, President. And so we want to recapture those dreams. We want, to, we want to begin to live out God's dream for our life. We want to reach our full potential. No one has yet, has yet fully reached their full potential. And so God uses dreams. He puts dreams in our hearts. He speaks to us through dreams. Uh, in the Old Testament, uh, God spoke to uh, his servants through dreams. It's amazing. Jacob had incredible dreams. Joseph, we're going to be looking at the life of Joseph today. Uh, In Genesis 37, at the age of 17, he had this dream that God spoke to him, uh, and it revolutionized his life, and it changed the world, really. Gideon had a dream, and Solomon had a a dream, and Abimelech had a dream, and even wicked kings had dreams. Nebuchadnezzar had a dream from God. Pharaoh had a a dream. His, His chief butler and baker had a dream. And the wise men from the east in Matthew's gospel, they had a dream. And Pilate's wife had a dream. And in that dream, she was warned of what her husband was about to do in condemning Messiah, condemning an innocent man. The power of a dream. There was a woman who was suffering, suffering a terminal illness, and uh, she had a dream, really. <laughs> she had a scheme, uh, how to cause trouble for her husband after her death. So she went to a portrait painter, and she, she told the portrait painter, I want you to paint a portrait of me. And the man said, great, come at such and such a time, such and such a place, and whatever you want me to, uh, the portrait you want me to paint of you, make sure you know, you're wearing that special gown, that special dress. So the woman shows up, and, and, the, and the guy began to, uh, began to the, port, the painter began to paint this portrait of her, and she said, now I need you to do something. I need you to add a beautiful diamond emerald necklace around my neck, a beautiful diamond emerald necklace. And the man said, well, that's great. Why don't you go get it? She said, I don't have one. He says, well, I don't understand. She said, upon my death, I want this portrait of myself for my husband to put it up in the home. And he has an eye on a neighbor lady down the road. And I want her to spend the rest of her life looking for that diamond emerald necklace. (laughs) So not all dreams are from God. Look at Genesis 37, 19. Let's read uh, this verse out loud together. Here comes the dreamer, they said. One more time. Here comes the dreamer. Let's pray. God, we, we thank you for the power of a heavenly dream, the power of a heavenly vision, the dreams that you put in our heart, the, the dream seeds that are planted in our heart even at childhood. God, many of them are there by your divine, by divine placement. And those seeds need to be watered, that those dream seeds may grow. And that, Lord, as we live our lives to honor you in pursuit of you, committed, God, to your plan for our life, those dreams will become a reality. I pray, Lord, that your people here at Trinity will rise to this 30-day challenge, God, to reclaim the dream of God for their heart and their life and pursue you, and in pursuing you, that dream, those dreams will become a reality. I pray and ask your grace and blessing now in Jesus' name. Everyone said amen. Joseph dreamed a dream at the age of 17. Many of you know the story. You can read the story, and I would encourage you to read the story in Genesis 37. Back in July of this year, I had completed my reading through the Bible in a year. So the next morning, I was going to get up, and I was going to start my uh, Bible reading plan all over again. And the plan that I selected from the Bible app that I use was going to be in chronological order. So I began reading in Genesis back in July. And as I was reading through Genesis, and I came once again to the story of Joseph, and I was thinking about a sermon series for the fall, it dropped in my heart this idea about reaching our potential and out of the life of Joseph and how at the age of 17 God gave him this dream And it was a powerful dream. So powerful was this dream that his own brothers despised him for it. And in that verse that we just read, and in a derogatory way, when they saw their brother approaching and they said, here comes that dreamer. Uh, You see, 
When you dream God's dream for your life, not everybody's going to celebrate. When you dream God's dream for your future, not everyone's going to encourage you and support that dream. That was the case of Joseph. God gave him this incredible dream, this dream that, that one day the stars, the sun, and the moon would bow down before him. And when Joseph shared that dream with his brothers and with his parents, they, his parents couldn't understand it, and his brothers understood that it meant that one day the youngest brother, the punk brother of the family, that the older brothers were going to one day bow down to him, and they didn't like that. They already had a problem with Joseph because he was Jacob's favorite son. You should never show favoritism as parents. We know that. It's a poor parenting skill that we are to love our children the same, equally. And Jacob loved Joseph just a little bit more, gave him this coat of, of many colors, and his brothers were jealous of him. And now this dream put him over the top. One day Joseph was, was on a mission, uh, on an assignment from his father to go check out how his brothers were faring. They were many, many miles away uh, from the home, tending to the family business of raising sheep. And when the brothers saw Joseph from afar, they plotted and planned how they might kill their own brother. Thankfully, the oldest brother, Reuben, the firstborn, he thought, I'll, I'll rescue my brother, I'll go along with the plan, and we, you know, we, we can't kill him, he's our own flesh and blood. So his brothers, they, they, when, they, when Joseph came to his brothers, they, they took him off his, his, the animal he was riding, they, they ripped his coat of many colors off of him, and they threw him in a pit. And they were intending to kill him, and Reuben intervened, but ultimately God supernaturally intervened. And around that same moment, providentially, a, a caravan of Ishmaelites was passing through, and the brothers decided to sell their own brother Joseph as a slave to Egypt, to the Ishmaelites. So the next thing Joseph knows, at the age of 17, he has this dream in his heart that he believed was real and was from God, and now he's in Egypt as a slave. These are circumstances that were completely and totally out of his control. And then he's sold as a slave to the captain of Pharaoh's guard, a man by the name of Potiphar. And he begins to work for this man by the name of Potiphar there in Egypt. Here's this Hebrew boy. He doesn't know the language, and he's living in a foreign land, and he seems as though he's the furthest point away from the reality of his dream, the dream becoming a reality in his life. But Joseph, because he's a, a God-fearing Hebrew, Joseph, because he was a young man with integrity, Joseph, because he was a young man with ethics. Joseph, because he was a young man with a moral compass. Joseph, because he had a true north. He had a purpose. He had a destination in his life. He made the best of his circumstances. You know the story. He actually rose to the top within Potiphar's house. He, he actually ran the, the, Potiphar's entire estate, Joseph, because he was hardworking and he had God's wisdom. And the Bible says that, that God made Joseph a success. You see, no matter what situation, no matter what circumstance you may find yourself in, God's blessing can be with you. God can make you a success. And what was setting Joseph apart from everybody that was alive at that point in time in the world? What set Joseph apart from his brothers? What made Joseph any different than his brothers? One thing, Joseph had a dream from God. You know, the Bible says without a vision, the people perish. We see how the lives of Joseph's brothers begin to deteriorate, begin to, life begin to leak out of them because they were visionless men. They were men without a dream. Woe to the man, woe to the woman who is visionless, who does not have a dream from heaven, who does not have a dream from God. And this dream inside of Joseph's heart, he didn't allow the current reality of his circumstances to superimpose themselves upon that dream thereby negating that dream. He still dreamed the dream. And he believed that dream was from God. He wasn't responsible for making that dream a reality. God was. He was only responsible for making the best of his circumstances that he, may find, that he found himself in. So he did that working for Potiphar. And then, you know, uh, God made Joseph a good-looking man. Okay? It wasn't his fault that he was a good-looking man. And he began to suffer sexual harassment in the workplace. Because Potiphar was married to the original desperate housewife. <laughs> the Bible tells us that Potiphar's wife began to cast longing eyes on Joseph. Apparently, she married Potiphar for his money and not for his looks. So this young, strapping, you know, 17-year-old strutting around the house got her attention. 
And she kept pestering him, and he kept saying no because he was a moral man. He, was a, he, had, a, he had a dream in his heart. He, he was not a visionless man. He wasn't going to succumb to the, to the temptations of the enemy. He wasn't going to give in to the flesh and thereby postpone or nullify or abort his dream. And he kept denying her and denying her. One day he went to the house, the Bible says, and all, everybody was out of the house. It was just Potiphar's wife and Joseph, and she was so desperate, she grabbed him and tried to forcibly make him lie over there. And, and he did the only thing a man should do in a moment like that. He fled the house and left his coat behind. It's interesting. He can't hold on to coats. His brother ripped his, the coat of many colors off him, and now Potiphar's wife is whipping the, this other coat that he got off of him. He ran out of the house, and Potiphar gets home, and she cries wolf. She cries rape, and this Hebrew that you brought in, shame me. And next thing you know, Joseph ends up in prison. Does he deserve to be there? No. And, you know, he was in an Egyptian subterranean dungeon prison. Okay, not like the prisons they have today. You know, your own cable television, exercise facilities, massage therapists, you know, you know, wonderful food and all. No, he was in a real prison. The Bible in the book of Psalms says that he was in chains at one point and he was suffering. And yet, because he was a moral man, because he was a man of integrity, because he was not a visionless man, he was a man with a vision for his life. Because he, didn't, he was not a dreamless man, but a man that had a dream from heaven, he once again rose to the top. He made the best of his circumstances. He wasn't in control of those circumstances, but he was in control of how he responded to those circumstances. Next thing you know, Joseph's basically running the prison. He has two prison uh, cellmates, the chief, Bucker, uh, chief Baker and the chief butler for Pharaoh. These guys have dreams. And uh, Joseph sees them one day, and they're both, you know, complex. He says, what's the problem? He says, well, we had dreams, and we don't know what they mean. He says, well, tell me the dreams, because God can interpret them. And so the baker told him the dream, and, and Joseph gave him an interpretation. It wasn't a good one, that in three days he was going to be dead, and he was. And the, the, the cupbearer gave him his dream, and Joseph said, in three days you're going to be restored, and you're going to be once again the cupbearer for Pharaoh. He says, hey, when you, when you get out of this place, put a good word in for me. I don't belong here. Well, the cupbearer forgot about Joseph. But then a couple of years, few years pass, and Pharaoh has this dream. And it's perplexing to him. It's a horrifying dream. Of skinny cows and, 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 and stalks of grain, you know, that have withered. And he's perplexed, and no one can interpret his magicians. And, you know, the, the, uh, the, the wise men of his court could not interpret it. And then the cupbearer goes, oh, yeah, I remember this guy that I was in prison with. He can interpret dreams. He's a Hebrew. Pharaoh says, bring him to me at once. And so they, they get Joseph, they clean him up. And Joseph is standing before Pharaoh now. He, he went from the pit to Potiphar's house to the prison, and now he's standing in a palace. And Pharaoh says, I've had these dreams, what do they mean? And Joseph said, God can give you the interpretation. And Joseph gave the interpretation along with a strategy and a plan on what to do when this global economic crash, this famine, hits the earth. Pharaoh said, there's no man as wise as you. And that day, Joseph was elevated and promoted to second in command over the most powerful nation in the world. And at the age of 30, 13 years later, from the time he was 17, the dream that God placed in his heart was now becoming a reality. You see, God is a dream maker, and he wants us to dream his dream for our life. And sometimes maybe we don't have a dream of God yet for our life. Find someone that has a dream from God for their life and hook up to their dream until God gives you your own dream. You see, Joseph's brothers didn't have this supernatural dream that came from heaven, but they could have hitched their wagons to Joseph's dream and God would have blessed them as much as he was blessing Joseph. But they chose not to do that. They chose to play the role of the antagonist, to work uh, as an emissary for the enemy, to try to kill the dream of, uh, in Joseph's heart. A dream is what can set your life apart, can set my life apart. I remember it was December 31st, 1979. Many of you have heard my testimony, and, and uh, that was the last night that I went out on a partying fling. And uh, I went, came home, and I fell asleep, and I, and I had been reading the Bible, and my sister had been witnessing to me, and others had been witnessing to me, and the conviction of the Holy Spirit was on my life, but I had not yet surrendered my life to Christ. And, and I went to bed, and I was drunk, and I was stoned. And I, and, I, and I had a dream that I died and went to hell, and it was so real. I'm telling you, it was so real. It was like I woke up screaming because I felt the flames of hell. I'm like, what stuff were you smoking, Pastor Toby? 
This was not what I, that wasn't what I was smoking that. It was the Lord getting a hold of my life because he knows how to do that. And I woke up in, in, in terror and I cried out to God for his mercy and I called on Jesus and it was real. And I went back to sleep and I had another, I had another dream. And in this dream, Jesus appeared to me and he gave me my life mission at that moment. It doesn't always happen this way, but it can. And in that moment, the Lord gives me my life mission, and it set the course of my life. And I begin to dream this dream that one day I would pastor a church like this. And it took many, many years through trial and error and successes and failures for me to eventually reach the fulfillment of the dream that God put in my heart at the age of 17. And I was thinking about this, and last night after service, my wife and I were on our way home, and I was thinking about, whoa, wait a minute, you know, this week, September 9th of this week, will be the 13th anniversary. Because 13 years ago, on September the 9th, 2001, just two days before 9-11, I showed up to this church, stood on this platform, and preached my very first sermon to this congregation. I mean, how awesome is that, right? 13 years later, here we are. I don't know what your dream is. Sometimes we have a dream that we think is God's dream, but God has a bigger dream. Sometimes, I woke somebody up there, that's why I had some special effects. No extra charge for that. <laughs> I was getting ready to worship and they had that spotlight came right by me. I, I thought somebody had just come brush right by me. I'm like, was that an angel? Oh, it was a spotlight. Okay. So, I uh, forgot what I was saying. <laughs> Sometimes we dream a dream that's not God's dream for our life. <laughs> so that dream has to die so that he can give us his dream. You know, sometimes we have to let a dream die because it's our own dream so that God can give us a bigger dream, which is his dream. God wants us to dream a dream, his dream for our life. And here's what I love about Joseph. See, if you're going to reach your potential, you got to take your cue from Joseph. you got to realize that there are things you're not in control of, but then there are many things you are in control of. And if you're going to take this 30-day challenge and if you're going to reach your potential, you're going to begin to move towards the God-given dream in your life or discovering the God-given dream in your life, you're going to have to realize what you can control and what you can't control. What I love about the story of Joseph is this. Sometimes the fulfillment of God's dream in your life and my life doesn't come very easily. What I love about the story of Joseph is that he possessed a sober view, a sober view of the challenging circumstances that he found himself in, in a pit, in a prison, as a slave. Yet, he never allowed the reality of his circumstances to superimpose themselves upon the dream, therefore altering or negating the dream that God placed in his heart. He probably had to grapple with the reality of, why are these things happening to me? Why have my own brothers betrayed me? Why am I a slave in Egypt? I don't know, but I know there's a God in heaven And ultimately, he is sovereign. Ultimately, he is in control of all things. And my trust is in him. It's not in my circumstances. Do you ever feel like your world's out of control? At times, we we find ourselves in in a circumstance of life or circumstance of life, and it seems as though life is spinning out of control. You know, we're, we're we're a society that actually loves wanting to be in control. A society that actually thinks we're in control when ultimately we're not. God's in control. I brought with me a remote control from my house. And every man just like woke up like, whoa. <laughs> you, now you're talking my language. Because men have a fetish over these things, don't we guys? Ladies, those of you that aren't married yet, wait, see, the man you're going to marry... Watch how he changes when he goes to his man cave area and he grabs hold of the remote control, especially when it's football season. You never want to come between a man and his remote control. Just just some, you know, pastoral advice, ladies. (laughs) Okay, dumb joke alert. So I've given you fair warning. What do husbands consider house cleaning? Lifting up their feet so their wife can vacuum underneath them. (laughs) I warned you. Okay. Okay, one more, one more, one more. How do you get a man to do sit-ups? Put the remote control between his toes. See, you thought dog was man's best friend. No, remote control is man's best friend. 
So we live in a crazy society. We can do everything now by remote control, right? I remember a time when watching television, you had to actually get up off the couch or the chair and walk over to the TV set, and there was this knob sticking out of the TV set, and you had to actually turn the channel manually. You young people are like, what? How old is he? <laughs> they have barely had electricity back then. Now we do everything by remote. You sit there, yeah, change it. I don't like that. Change the commercial, change it. Or we can just, you know, set our DVR and watch our favorite shows and fast forward the commercials, right? But if I really like the show, in the back of my mind, I say, hey, thanks for paying for this show that I can watch for free. And, and if, it's a, if it's a good product, I, I will go buy it, okay? Because, you know, they're, they're paying for it. So whatever. And, uh, but we like being in control. I mean, you can do everything by remote control. You can, you can run your appliances by remote control. I mean, you can get an app on your smartphone, and you can, like, lock and unlock the doors of your house. You can look at a video of what's going on in your house. Right now, I can arm or disarm my alarm system at home. I could freak my wife out right now. She's getting ready, you know. How come the alarm was just set or, um, you know, turned off? Carl's playing games again, you know. I mean, you can do everything by remote. You can turn your sprinkler system on and off, you know, by, by remote control. But here's the crazy thing. We love remote control so much. Have we come to expect to control, have remote control spirituality, remote control Christianity? Have we come to the place where we think that we can have a remote control faith? Where we can remotely control God? Huh? Where we actually think that, that we're in control and God's not in control, that we've, we've grown so accustomed to the idea of being in control that we don't give God the control that he rightfully deserves and must have in our own lives, in our unpredictable, fast-paced world that we live in, many people today feel as though their lives are out of control. A study, a recent study, found that 61% of Americans feel at least one aspect of their lives is completely and totally out of control. The top three areas of the respondents, personal health, household matters, and finances. Uh, one company official says four in ten people between the age of 18 and 44 admit that they have trouble controlling their finances. People feel as though their lives are out of control. Maybe if we want more control, we have to give up control to God. Now, Joseph had this sobering view of his circumstances. He realized what he could not control and what he could control. And there's wisdom in that. See, there are things you and I can't control. We can't control the global economy. Right? We can't control the growing national debt. But you know what we can control? We can control our own personal debt. And as a church, we're committed to come alongside of you and teach you the biblical principles of finances, the wisdom of God that has done the Hebrew people, the Jewish people good for 6,000 years. And that if we could learn these economic principles from Scripture, it could revolutionize our lives. That's why we, we have Financial Peace University. That's why we, we're committed uh, to help you uh, become biblically educated regarding economic stewardship issues in your life. We want you to find control in an area that many feel is out of control. You see, you can't control the weather. How many are thankful for the rain that we've been getting? Amen? Yeah. Oh. Thank you, Lord. It just puts us all in a better mood, you know? When I see rain and water flowing on the street, I'm like, yeah, this is good. I feel good today. You know, thank you, Lord. You can't control the weather. You can't control whether or not your company is going to downsize a week from now, a month from now, a year from now. But you know what you can control? You can control how you're going to react. And you can have a contingency plan in place. You can't control uh, what others do. But you can control how you respond to what they do. Think about this. Joseph could not control his brother's plot to kill him. He couldn't have stopped them even if he wanted to. Ten against one, right? He couldn't control the fact that he was sold as a slave into Egypt. He couldn't control the fact that he was falsely accused and thrown into prison. He couldn't control those circumstances. Those circumstances were completely out of his control. But what he could control is his response to being in those different circumstances. I was reading a business book uh, a few months ago, and they were talking about this concept of control. And they say that people, in their research, people make 
one of two errors when it comes to this concept of control. Number one, we overestimate what we can control. And number two, we underestimate what we can control. Did you get that? We, we, number one, we overestimate what we control, and we underestimate what we can control. So a team of researchers, they conducted an experiment with a group of volunteers who were asked to perform a task on a computer screen. And midway through the assignment, the screen changed from black letters on white background to an annoying violet color, at which point a tab appeared with a message that with the clicking of the mouse, you could change the color back to normal. So people were randomly assigned to one of four conditions in this research, in this test. From high control, where 85% of their clicks actually did change the color on the screen, to moderate control, where 50% of their clicks changed, to low control, where only 15% of their clicks actually literally changed the color of the screen, to a group or category of individuals that had had absolutely no control. No matter how hard and fast they, they, they clicked the mouse, it wasn't going to change anything. So guess what happened at the end of this experiment? Those with high to moderate control actually believed they had no control over changing the color of the screens. Those that had low to no control actually believed that what they were doing was actually changing the outcome of what they were seeing on the screen. And what they concluded from this research was this. When people have low to no control, they overestimate their control. When they have high and moderate control, they underestimate their control. So not only do people suffer from being under the illusion that they have control, the study also shows that people also suffer under the illusion that they have no control when they actually do have control. So here's the deal. Here's the human condition. We falsely think we have no control over the areas of our life that we actually have control over, and then we spend most of our time trying to control the things of our life that we absolutely have no control over. And if we would start spending our time controlling the things we can control and not trying to control the things we can't control, we might have more control. <laughs> Are you following me? If you're not confused yet, you will be, I promise. Listen, Joseph couldn't control his brothers. He couldn't control Potiphar's wife, nor could he control the, the famine, the global uh, economic hard times that he found himself in. What he could control was the choices that he made while he was in those circumstances. You can't control how your spouse, your adult kids, or your boss treats you, but you can control how you respond to how they treat you. You see, to be in control, sometimes maybe we have to let go and give God control, right? To realize your God-given dreams and thereby fulfill your potential, you must make decisions based on what you can control. That's what Joseph did. He knew what he could control and what he could not control. You're not in control of how... You're in control of how you choose to be in your marriage, regardless of what your spouse does or doesn't do. And don't wait for them to change. You become the change you want to see in them. You can't change your kids, but you can change your input into the environment called your home, thereby giving your family members the, the best chance to change or not. Because at the end of the day, we really can't change another human being. Only God can change a life. Only God can change a heart. You can't change your boss, but you can change how you respond to your boss, or you can get a new job. <laughs> I have a family member. Right? Uh, they had me going, right? They're, they're, they, had, they had this three jobs ago. They're like, my boss, she's a witch. My boss, and like, I'm like, man, she is a bad lady. Man, she's the devil incarnate. So then they got a new job. And now it wasn't a female boss, it was a male boss. And they began to say, they're like the same story. My boss this, my boss, I can't believe. They do that, he does that, and I'm like, well, he's a bad boss. And then they got their third job, their latest job. And it started all over again. My boss this, my, and I realized, it's not the boss, it's you. <laughs> and I told them that, and they didn't like it. <laughs> on one hand, we overestimate our control. On the other hand, we underestimate our control. You see, we can't control what happens to us. We can control how we respond to what happens to us. In closing, there are three things you can control. Three things you can control to reach your full potential. Number one, we control the thoughts that we think. <laughs> Look at Philippians 4.8. I love this out of the Amplified version of the Bible. For the rest, brethren, whatever's true, 
Whatever is worthy of reverence and is honorable and seemly, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely and lovable, whatever is kind and winsome and gracious, if there's any virtue and excellence, if there's anything worthy of praise, think on and weigh and take account of these things. Fix your minds on them. Change your thinking. Change your life. Think on good things. Meditate and dwell, not on the bad, not on the negative, not on the failures. Learn the lesson you have to learn from those failures. And then change the way you think. Now, how many of you know we can't control every thought that comes into our mind? I wish we could. Just program. I'm going to think all good thoughts today. Recorded? Great. It's going to be a great day. Now, sometimes, you know, you get crazy thoughts that enter your mind. Thoughts you're like, whoa, where'd that come from? How many of you have had some bad thoughts this week, this month, this year, within the last 15 seconds? <laughs> so what we have to do is, here's what we're in control of. The thought enters our mind. We say, that thought's not Christ-honoring. Boop, hit the delete button. You're gone. Adios. Anathema, that thought. Curse be that thought. Go back to hell from whence thou comest. <laughs> Whatever it works for you. You know what I'm talking about? We're in control of our thoughts. As a man thinks in his heart, so is he. You think and dwell on something long enough, it will become a reality in your life because your life will begin to move and gravitate towards that. So make sure the thoughts that you're allowing to come into your mind are thoughts that, as Philippians 4, 8, Paul describes, are worthy of your meditation, worthy of your consideration. You have control over your thoughts. Number two, we have control over the attitude we adopt. Look at Philippians 2.5. Let's read this out loud together. Here we go. Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus. One more time. Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus. Now, some of you, some of us sometimes have the attitude is the same as that of Lucifer. How many, of you have, how, many, how many of you struggle with a bad attitude from time to time? Come on, raise your hand. Thank you. The rest of you are dishonest or scared or whatever. <laughs> we all do. Sometimes we need an attitude adjustment, don't we? What Zig Ziglar used to say, it's not your aptitude, but your attitude that determines your altitude. Man, there's a lot of truth to that. So many people have such a stinky attitude. What is wrong with you? You got the wrong programming going on, my friend. That's what's wrong with you. You got to delete those old shows and you got to add the right shows to your life. Amen. And we have to begin to gauge our attitude. We're in control of that. There's that famous doctor that was in a concentration camp, Dr. Frankel, Victor Frank, uh, psycho psychologist. What was, it? what was his name? Victor Frank? Yeah. Somebody Google it. Hey, real quick. Hey, well, whatever. Okay, never mind. But he wrote a book. He was in a concentration camp, in the worst of circumstances. He said, the one thing that we were in control of, the one thing the Nazis couldn't take from us, they could take our dignity, they could, they could take our food, they could take our clothing, they could, they could take our money, they, could, they couldn't take the attitude that we choose to possess on any given day. Oh, such wisdom in that. We're in control of our attitude. And the final thing that we're in control of is our actions, the actions that we take. You know, God loves you, and the proof of God's love for you is that he created you like him. We're creating the image and likeness of God, right? And in what way are we like God? In, in many ways, we're like God, and, and in a lot of ways, we're not like God. But we're to be like God. As Christians, you're to be godly. You know what that means, to be godlike, not to become a god. That ain't going to happen. But to be godly, to be like God. You know, in one area that you're like God and I'm like God, all created beings are like God, God created us as free moral agents, the power to choose. How many of you own a dog? You own a dog? How many of you like your dog? Yeah. You know, dogs are awesome. You know why dogs are awesome? Because they show unconditional love. You can be a stinker from the time you get up to the time you go to bed. That dog will always be happy to see you and will always, you know, they're, they're, they, 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 when, they lick, when a dog licks you, it's a genuine lick. 
Yeah, I've, never, I've never seen a dog like pretend to lick you. Yeah. Like we pretend to love some people in our lives. I mean, when a dog leaves you, like they, they really mean it. Or they're thirsty and want some salt or whatever. <laughs> now, they have, the, they, have all, they have all kinds of rope, uh, automated inventions these days. I just read in the news that there's this a robot couch that will take you to your refrigerator. The world's going to end now, I know. Now we are in the last days. Okay? <laughs> there are people that have too much time on their hands. A couch that will take you <laughs> to the refrigerator and then take you back. Oh, my goodness. They have, they have remote control dogs. You know, I would never want to own a, a robot dog because I would know that that robot, do robot dog wasn't barking because it was happy to see me. It was, it's barking because it was programmed to do that. Bark now. <laughs> right? See, the way God created you and me, he created us free moral agents. You don't have to be in church today, but you chose to be here. You don't have to love God, but you're choosing to love God. You don't have to forgive your friend who sinned against you, but you choose to do so because you want to obey God. You don't have to love your neighbor, but you choose to love your neighbor because it's a choice, more than a feeling, it's a choice. Why? Because God said, love your neighbor, right? So we are in control of the actions. Now, you know, if I were God, it would have been a whole lot easier if he simply made us like a bunch of machines, automated robots, and pre-programmed, you will love me with all your heart. Boop. Now, okay, you're programmed, him out. Next up, okay, you will serve me with all your, boop, he's programmed, you're out, you know. I mean, it would be cool to be a pastor they could use like this magical spiritual remote control, right? You could just say, all this section, tither starting next week. <laughs> all, all this section, volunteer starting next week. I mean, you could just like program people. I mean, they had a movie like this once, right? I mean, if you're married to a woman that's like talk, talk incessantly, talk, 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 you could just say, pause. <laughs> and, right, and then admits it, you can go do what you need to do, you know, go play golf and come back. And, oh, yeah, really? And she gets in anyway. I don't know where that came from. We overestimate what we can control. We, we underestimate what we can control and what we can't control. We're in control of our actions. Here's the final verse. Look at uh, Ezra 10.4. It says this. Get up. It's your duty to take action. We are with you, so be strong and take action. I want us to read this verse out loud together, but you have to say it with attitude, okay, because the first part of that verse has an exclamation mark. So you've got to say it with gusto. Here we go. Get up. <laughs> I like that. One more time. Get up! It's your duty to take action. We are with you, so be strong and take action. You're in charge of the thoughts you think, the attitudes you adopt, and the actions that you take. God can't make you love him, obey him, serve him. He gave you free will. That's your choice. But you can do it. Ezra wrote, this verse comes out of the book of Ezra, chapter 10. What was happening in the book of Ezra is revival was coming back to the people of God. They had come back to their homeland. The temple was being rebuilt, had been rebuilt. And now they needed to get their own person. The house of God was in order. Now they needed to get their own house in order. And many of the Hebrew men had married pagan wives. And now God, through the prophet, uh, and through the priest Ezra, was saying, now you need to do what's right. You need to send those pagan wives away and start honoring God's commands. And he says, it's time to get up. It's time to get going. And you can do it because we're here to help you. It's time for you to take action. What a great word for Americans today. What a great word for the body of Christ today. It's time to get up. It's time to start taking action. It's time to take control over what you are in control of and stop relinquishing and giving that control over to others or over to the circumstances. You can't control everything, but the things you can control, your thoughts, your attitude, your actions. God is saying, begin to act out in faith and watch what he will do to make those dreams in your heart a reality. Like every head bowed, every eye closed. Father, we humbly come before you today. Lord, help us, help us to know the things we can control and the things we can't control. Help us, God, to take the things that are out of our control and to entrust them to you because ultimately you have ultimate control. And Lord, for the things that we can control, may we begin by your grace with your divine wisdom to exercise control over our thoughts, our attitude, our actions in any given situation. 
that, Lord, we would believe in the dream in our heart that you placed there, even though our circumstances are screaming against that dream ever becoming a reality. We will stay true to the dream that you've placed in our heart, knowing that you're the dream maker, and you will make it real. Heads bowed and eyes closed if you're here today, and you don't know Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior. You can invite Christ into your life right where you're seated. The Bible says in Revelation 3.20, he stands at the door and knocks, and if any man will hear his voice and open up the door of his heart, Christ will come into you and have fellowship with you, and you can have fellowship with him. Your sins will be forgiven, and heaven will be your eternal home. Just pray this prayer out loud. The rest of us, say it with your own mouth. Mean it from your own heart. Romans 10.9 says, if you'll confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart, God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Say this prayer out loud with the rest of us. Dear God in heaven, I know I'm a sinner in need of a Savior. There's only one Savior. His name is Jesus. I call upon you, Jesus. I ask you now, come into my heart. Come into my life. Be my Lord. Be my Savior. I turn from sin to the true and living God. Dear God in heaven, you're now my Father, and I am your child. Fill me now with your Holy Spirit and give me strength to live for you and serve you all the days of my life, beginning today, in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. We love you guys. Have an awesome rest of the day.